Mm. And God invited all serious Christians to come to the sale. The person that was going to make the sales was the devil. Mm. And uh, somehow God agreed with the devil to come and sell to the children of God the tricks he, the devil, uses to pull them away from God. It was a very packed sales. I was there. And um, a lot of other Christians who are trying to be serious were there. As the sales went on, a lot of people were purchasing things from the devil. Purchasing things. And I want you to see the kind of things that we are purchasing. The purpose of this sale was to discover what the devil used to pull people away from God. And if you turn with me to your Bible, the book of Galatians, chapter 5, verse 19 to 21, you will see the things that the devil was set selling. Can we all turn to our Bibles, whether it's electronic Bibles or physical Bibles? Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 to 21. The devil was selling sexual immorality, saying this is one of the tricks that I used to pull Christians away from God. If you are in Galatians chapter 5, can you raise your hand for me? Sure, I'm not alone. Okay. Chapter 5, verse 19. People approached the devil and he sold impurity to them. Lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outburst of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and many, many, many types of sins. And the devil told them, these are the things that used to pull you away from God. If you are able to realize this, then you'll be closer to God. Then there was something there that had no name on it. And one Christian approached the devil and said, why don't you have a name on this? And why don't you have a price tag on this? The devil said, I don't have a name on it because I don't want Christians to know this trick. It is one of the most valuable tricks to me, and that is why it is priceless. I do not wish to sell it today, and I do not want them to know the name. The man went further. I really want to purchase this trick. Because I think I have read Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 to 21 over and over again. And I know all these tricks you're selling, but I want to know this one that has no name. Reluctantly, Mr. Devil told him that this trick was discouragement. He said, discouragement? That's interesting. Why don't you want to sell discouragement out? And he said, I'm going to tell you the advantages of discouragement to me, the devil. It doesn't have any advantages to the devil, to the Christians, but it does have, this affected my mind, it does have advantages to me, to the The first advantage of discouragement to me is that when I discourage couples in marriage, they decide not to live together anymore. I walk on their minds, I walk on the mind of the man, I walk on the mind of the woman. And I start making them to see reasons why they made the mistake of coming together in the first place. I say, can you really take this anymore? Are you sure God was really with you? Are you sure this was not an illusion? Can you give me the signs again that prove to you that we are supposed to be married to this man? I start bringing up things to them and putting it upon your face and trying to discourage them and telling them that marriage is not the best thing and tell, telling them that this is one of the mistakes they made in their lives but that it's not too late, they can still part. And so as I discourage them and I continue to grow this seed of discouragement in their hearts over the years, love between them grows cold and finally dies. And eventually, 
That seed of discouragement brings about divorce or separation or living together so that people are outside will not know that you're really separated, but two of you know that you are no longer the couples you used to be before. That is one big advantage I use discouragement to do in couple. This Christian said, well, that's just one. Can you tell me more? Yes, the devil went on. The second advantage of discouragement to me is to students. When I put discouragement in the minds of students, I make them to be not in a very good time with their, with their lecturers and tutors, and when they give them bad grades, they decide to give up. And that is why there are many dropouts in schools today. And that is why many students make bad grades in schools today, because they have decided that no matter what I write, this lecturer will not give me a good grade. Mm. And so those who are originally A students, because I have discouraged them not to put in their best in their assignments, they end up as C students. Mm -hmm. Because I have worked in their hearts, say, don't worry about this. There's nothing you will write that will impress them. Just submit the assignment. And so I continue to use this on students, I use this on students, and many of them eventually drop out, or many of them eventually do so bad in their grades, and many of them will, will be questioning God, why God, I, is this really me? What's going on? Am I really in the right course? I have used discouragement to achieve a lot of things in schools, that is why there are many dropouts and gas stars out of schools today. Hmm, second point. Please tell me more. The devil said, I have a third point. But you're pushing me. I think I'm giving away my secret. The man said, I'm, I'm really interested. So the third way I use discouragement is in the church. I make Christians to see things in other Christians that they are not supposed to see. How? I make Christians to see other people's sins without seeing theirs. So what, do you, what do you mean? Yeah. I have turned this discouragement in a way that people will be discouraged by seeing sins in the lives of Christians they uphold so high while forgetting that they have the same type of sin. And so when they are discouraged from the behaviors of those who are held so high, they kind of like, I think I'm doing okay. Mm -hmm. And so when you start thinking that you're doing okay, then there is no room for growth. He said, continue in this. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in this. I'm no longer a student. I don't think I'm going to divorce with my wife. I'm interested in this your third point. He said, okay. An example is having somebody in your church betray you in any way. And then you're there brooding, are we not supposed to be brothers? Are we not supposed to be Christians? Are we not supposed to be one fellowship, one body? Why am I getting this from the church? Maybe I shouldn't go there next week. I guess there is no way in the Bible that God says only people that go to church will inherit eternal life. Mm -hmm. I've read my Bible over and over again. Because instead of my fellowshipping among people who are hypocrites, think I better do an e church. And the man pressed me and said, tell me more. The devil said, I think I'm going to stop here today because I've almost sold the item to you. But I still hold my item because there is still a lot more about discouragement that I wouldn't want you to know. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, be self-controlled and alert. 
your enemy the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone and I'm going to use this courage in the place of devour because devouring you with discouragement is devouring you completely I have a couple of versions here that I want us to look at New Living Translation says stay alert watch out for your great enemy the devil he's looking for someone to discourage English Standard Version says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, is seeking someone to discourage. International Standard Version says, be clear-minded, be alert. Your opponent, the devil, is looking for someone to discourage. And there was another version that really caught my attention, and that was the Weymouth New Testament version. It says, curb every passion and be on the alert. Your great accuser, the devil, is going about like a roaring lion looking for someone to discourage. There was a man, his name was Benny D. Merchant. He was invited to come and preach at a rally many years ago. The only way to get there to preach the gospel was through a seaplane. So on the afternoon of August 31, 1976, Brother Dimachant, Sister Margaret, and another young preacher, Jose Sink, boarded the plane to go to the raft. About eight miles away from the city, the rain shower along with heavy winds overtook them. In the middle of that storm, the engine of the seaplane stalled and the plane plummeted towards a bay of water. The storm was whipping the winds into six foot waves and down the plane bolted toward them. Brother the merchants managed to land upright, but the storm surged, caught one of the wings, wings of the cartwheel of the plane and cartwheeled the plane. The plane begins to sink. With all of them, what were they going to do? They were going to preach. I want you to see the kind of things that happens even when you're on a good course. They, they, they trapped all of them. And, but somehow, Brother the Merchant made it to the back of the plane, broke out a window, and swam to the surface. But Jose and Sister Margaret could not get out and they drowned. Despite all the efforts to save their lives. Unable to free them, the boat from the shore managed to tow the plane to the shore. Brother Depart the merchant said that when they unloaded the bodies of this young man and young woman, it was like a dream. It was like eternity as he saw the bodies of those that they had prayed together and left on a just cause to preach the gospel in a strange land. The next three days were difficult because they went through the arrangements of taking Jose's funeral, taking his body for funeral and also shipping Sister Margaret's body back to the United States. But that was not really the main thing that brought discouragement. What brought discouragement was that in this crisis that Brother Dimachan managed to escape himself, some creative news reporters were having fun. They wrote that the crash had been on purpose for the sole reason of collecting insurance settlements. Others cooked up their story 
with different reasons, all pointing to that the accident should not have happened in the first place, that the reason for its happening was selfish to get monetary gain. He felt so betrayed by some of the prominent members of his community whom he had helped to fly many thousands of miles on his plane for medical reasons and he saw them turn their backs on him as he thought about the physical betrayal by people he, he thought would support him and know that this was not an intentional crash. The loss of the two lives in the crash drowned him. And discouragement shouted at him, give up and quit. What kind of God are you serving? What are you going to do? How can he leave you in this kind of moment? Who is with you? Everybody is gone. Even people you have helped are telling you that you want some monetary settlement for your own play. But in the early hours of September 3, as he wept and prayed earnestly and questioned God, quote, why? Why? Why, Lord, would you allow this to happen when it seemed the future was so bright? Suddenly, a tall man in white appeared in the door of his room. He approached Brother Dimachant, turned sideways and slightly bent on his shoulder. He looked at him and placed his hand on his shoulder. And he asked him a question. He said, have I not called you to this country to preach the gospel? I am pilot in command of your life. Get up and go on with the work. I will bless you and the work as never before. This man turned and left the door. And for the first time in a long time, Brother Dimachan said that fearlessness overwhelmed him. He had the kind of strength that discouragement was ripping away from him. And he suddenly realized that thousands have heard of the accident and we are praying for him. And he knew that this was not the time to let discouragement eat him up. He has traveled all this. Why, is, why was it that he even survived? There was a reason why he survived. And the reason why he survived is why this man, dressed in white, which I want to believe for Jesus Christ, said, have I not called you to walk? Get up and move on. Brothers and sisters, this afternoon, as you ponder on the advantages of discouragement to the devil, I want you to remember all these advantages whenever discouragement comes to you. Because there are many, many other promises that counteract discouragement when they come to you. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 5 says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. When it seems the devil has drowned your mind with so much things to quit and say no more, remember that Jesus says in John chapter 16 verse 33, Be of good cheer. I have overcome ways that you are facing discouragement at this time? Do you walk and walk and walk and do overtimes, double shifts, triple shifts? At the end of the day, you don't even know where to start to pay the bills. I have so many bills on my desk that I don't want to look at them. Because as I get them, as I gradually finish trying, thinking I'm done with them, <laughs> another set arrives. So I'm here writing checks, praying that they will not bounce. 
And then, and finally, God is granting the prayer, I get another stack of bills. And the third thing is that they don't come the same day. They keep coming. It's like every week something is coming in the mail. Something is coming and it's just like, this is a bill. Mm. And they're like, should I, what, what should I do with this? What should I do? Are there situations in your life that may be in a form of sickness? Or just something you've been battling with? Maybe a co-worker at work. Maybe a bad boss. Maybe just something that is just trying to eat you up and allow the devil to have an advantage in your life with discouragement, then this message is for you. Mm. That you have realized today that one of the hidden agendas that the devil uses to trick people into various sins, because discouragement can make you to commit suicide. Discouragement, as we've read, can cause divorces. Discouragement can make you to quit church. Discouragement can make you, when you want to pray, you like, God, I've already been praying. What else do you want me to say? Discouragement can lead you to every type of sin just by the growth of discouragement. Then realize it today because God has spoken to you that discouragement, the advantages are only to the devil, not to the Christians. Discouragement is not from God. As I wrap up this message, which I hope was short today, I want you not to forget that Jesus said in John chapter 16, verse 33, Be of good cheer.